Welcome to Harmony Talk, a podcast about dreamers and doers. From every walk of life, sports, business, culture, and entertainment, social impact, and more, this podcast is brought to you by A.M. Skyer, a third-generation family insurance business started in 1920. I'm your host, Lisa Shampo. Today's guest is Dan Michike, the current music director and conductor of the very popular and long-running show Wicked on Broadway. Dan has actually been with the show for more than nine years, including participation in national and international tours. As part of the music team, he is an integral member of the casting process, and we'll get to that shortly. Dan is a multi-talented entertainer. He is also an accomplished musician, actor, and singer. Dan began his acting career on Broadway as the youngest actor to play Mary Sunshine in the Tony Award-winning revival of Chicago. He performed in 2,000 shows across 125 cities around the world, quite a task. In 2008, Dan performed as a soloist in Leonard Bernstein's Mass at Carnegie Hall, the Kennedy Center, and the United Palace. He was the first male to record the male soprano solo in I Don't Know, which was nominated for a 2008 Grammy Award via Naxos, a record distributor of classical music. As an accomplished conductor and performer, Dan has led many workshops and master classes and is, in fact, a co-founder of the International Music Theater Academy and the owner of Hit It Productions. And there's more, and I love this one. Dan actually started a company that brings Broadway into your home or business. Without further ado, welcome, Dan, to Harmony Talk. Thank you so much. What a lovely intro. <laughs> now, let's start right at the beginning. You grew up in Connecticut. Did you always dream about being on Broadway or being a performer? How did it all get started? I definitely was that kid that it's what I've always wanted to do my entire life since when I was born. Very fortunate for that. And I was very blessed. I have two amazing parents that have always been very supportive. And growing up in Darien, Connecticut, but really my community theater and my theater life was in Stanford, Connecticut at Curtain Call. That's where I was really able to hone my skills and do a lot of my dreaming there. Well, you did go to the Boston Conservatory of Music, is that correct? So you did pursue an education in this as well. Yeah. My mom and I started researching universities and colleges very early on, and Boston Conservatory, when I was looking at schools, I would look in the playbills, and 42nd Street was on Broadway at the time, and there was like 14 alumni from Boston Conservatory, and there was a lot of wonderful talent and alumni that graduated from there, and so I actually always wanted to go to the Boston Conservatory since eighth grade. And so I was very fortunate to have my education, got my BFA from Boston and graduated in 2007. What a great tip for career-oriented performers. Look in the playbill, see where they went to college, where they went to school. Absolutely. So was Mary Sunshine your actual first big gig? Yeah. So when I graduated college, May of 2007, the first thing I did in New York was an off-Broadway show called Gemini, which was a big hit on Broadway as a play in the 80s and became a musical starring Linda Hart and Joel Blum, Beth Austin. And we did that off-Broadway shortly, sadly. But then I was very fortunate. Six months after graduation, I booked Mary Sunshine on Broadway. Now, how old were you then? I just turned 22. Oh, my goodness. I know it said you were the youngest ever to play that part, but that is very young. I mean, you've been pretty lucky, it's fair to say. I'm very, very fortunate. I always say to people, it's all about preparation, meeting opportunity. This business, no matter where you are at in your career, you still hustle. It's just a different kind of hustle at this point, but no one's going to do it for you. And so, uh, but I was also very, very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time with my education and certain things that opened up at the time. And you were very talented. Let's not forget that. Well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go from Mary Sunshine to Wicked. What happened in between and how'd you get there? Yeah. So I was with Chicago for six years. I ended up doing it all around the world, as well as back to the Broadway company nine different times. About three years into my run at Chicago, I started assisting Adam Gettle, who wrote Light in the Piazza and Floyd Collins. And his grandfather is, you know, a little person named Richard Rogers. Yeah, little big person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so he was looking for a pianist in New York for his classes that he taught. I was always a big fan of Adam Gettle. And so I auditioned for him and he hired me as his pianist in the city. And he was the first person to really be like, you should become a music director for the rest of your life. And I really wanted to. 
I thought it would happen much later on in my life. I ended up doing a minor in music direction and conducting at the Boston Conservatory. But, you know, I was always very, very fast track focused on being a performer when I graduated. And when Adam had that belief in me, I really was like, well, if you think I'm talented, then maybe I am. You know, he was able to put me in front of a bunch of different people that gave me the time of day. Because at that time, a lot of people just viewed me as Mary Sunshine in Chicago. And I was this actor and not part of the club. And I started playing anywhere I could. I played auditions. I played cabarets downtown at 54 Below. And when you say play, did you mean play the piano? Yes, play the piano and uh, conducted small little bands and this and that. And and I've always been a vocal coach for actors. When I started coaching actors, especially men that were my type, going in for roles, the same roles that I was going in for, I realized that I was able to get them to a place both musically and emotionally, a better place than I could get myself as an actor. And I found that very rewarding. And also I saw a lot of music directors that were wonderful, but didn't understand just the life in the orchestra, but also the life on stage doing eight shows a week and what physical and mental, emotional demand that takes. And so I was like, I would love to be that middleman, that communicator between those two worlds. Long story short, a friend of mine at the time was one of the conductors of the national tour of Wicked. And he's like, hey, I'll let the team know about you. And here's the score. Just start practicing it. And they could call tomorrow. They can call in six months. They can call in a couple of years. And so I started practicing the score every single day. And I ran into Stephen Aremus, who is the supervisor of Wicked. I ran into him on Ninth Avenue one night and I said, hi, I'm Dan Mitchkay. I'm that Mary Sunshine in Chicago. And I'm friends with so-and-so. I would love to play for you sometime. And he called me the next morning. I was prepared and I played the entire score for him. And he offered me a job to go out on the national tour as a pianist in two weeks. So it was nuts. I mean, a lot of it was, yes, I can do that when I really haven't done that yet. (laughs) That I think is a lot of a key to this business as well as any kind of success is, you know, you have to know your strengths and weaknesses, but also to be able to take that jump when someone asks you and you might not know everything about it, but yes, I can do that. And so that was in 2014. I originally joined the national tour as a keyboard three, a pianist and assistant conductor. And then two years later, I became the music director of that national tour. And then two years later from that, my whole life exploded and I became the music director and conductor and associate supervisor of the Broadway company. Well, you sort of touched on my next, what I'm going to ask you next, which is, you know, what does it mean to be a music conductor or director? I mean, it's a lot more than, it's not even really you performing. It's really coaching and tell me about it. Yeah. Really conducting the show eight shows a week is 10% of the job. It's 90% managerial and it's running that building with the production stage manager and the associate director. So a typical day in the morning, I'll look and see what emails, missed calls and text messages I've gotten from said people. Who's not showing up today? (laughs) Well, luckily, I don't have to deal with that part. That's really the stage manager, but really more like the director, the associate director, the music supervisor, just answering, seeing what's going on. And then I'm in about 10 hours of auditions every week because I hire both the actors for the national tour and the Broadway company. So if I'm in auditions during the day, uh, I'll do that. If I'm not in auditions, I'm usually in rehearsals. We have uh, understudy rehearsal every two weeks. We have put in rehearsals. We have brush up rehearsals for new people coming into the show. And then before the show, I'll either have notes to give out to some of the principals or the ensemble or my orchestra. 24 musicians in our orchestra on Broadway, along with 180 subs. So a lot of people don't know, but on Broadway, you pretty much have a different group of musicians every single night playing the score. It's a lot. And then on top of that, whatever has arised that day and conversations that I need to have in my office with people. And, and then we're do the show. 
So, and that's usually about a 10 hour day every day. That is a long day, but it's very exciting. It's certainly busy. Let's talk about auditions for a second. There may not be so many people lining up with experience like yours to be a conductor or a musical director, but there sure are a heck of a lot of people out there who want to sing on Broadway. I mean, it must be grueling to audition. You know, I really love auditions because I used to be an actor and my heart goes there and I just, I constantly want to better the show. And so auditions are a tool for me. Yes, there are many days where I see 500 people in eight hours and it's it's a lot. At this point of auditioning tens of thousands of people, I really kind of know at least 50% by the second they walk into the room, by their energy and confidence. And then vocally, I can tell in about two bars of music. So do you hear them out, though, or you just say thank you very much? Like, do I sing every single person? Yes, absolutely. But with open calls, they have eight bars which is about 40 seconds of music. And then with agent submissions, and when we are seeing people for the principals or understudies, they're given the packet, which is two songs that the character sings and a couple scenes. And that's usually like an eight to 10 minute audition. And if I'm interested, I'll give them notes and we will work on it and see how they handle direction. But so many things go into the factoring of that. A lot of it is first impressions of people owning themselves. People really need to realize that an audition is a job interview, um, but it's also needed to be balanced with we're meeting for coffee in a way. Like it needs to be that professional. A little bit conversational, right, but professional. Exactly, that real of a person. Like I don't want to see like a fake put on professional. So it's all different things. And then everyone knows everyone in this business. So you know, as we get down closer to callbacks, I do my due diligence of like, hey, how was that working with that person? Everyone talks, you know. And when these actors come in, do they come in already prepared to do, say, Alphaba or Glinda? Or do you say, I'd like you to do this or that? For open calls, they just come in and they sing their prepared song. And that's that. I will then put them in a file. Since we're a long running show, thankfully, we have files that If I'm interested in someone, I'll see them in six months. I'll see them in a year. Not every show has that luxury. And so then when we start to see Alphaba and Glinda and Fierro and Bach and Nessa and all those people, we'll have days. Like we had just had a bunch of Glinda days where we will call in Glindas that the casting director wants to see and that actresses that I've wanted to see over the last like six months. And there's many a times where I'll be out seeing someone's concert or all different places, or I've seen someone online and I'll tell the casting director, hey, I really like this person. Let's see them in the audition room. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. Is Donna McKechnie in the show now? Oh, yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> My girl. Well, did she have to audition? Donna McKechnie no. from Chorus Line? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's what I thought. <laughs> no. The legend herself? No. Donna was an offer, and we are so grateful that she said yes. She is everything that you'd want your idol to be. She is a class act. Great. That's wonderful to hear. Now, you said the orchestra changes somewhat every night, but you're doing the same score every night, night after night. You've been doing it for many, many years. What kinds of notes do you give to say that are different from, say, last night or going forward? At that caliber... When you're looking for subs as musicians, when the chair holder subs out, there's no audition. The sub learns the book on their own time, and their audition is their first show. So it's quite nerve wracking. But, you know, certain notes is play more on the stick, don't play behind the stick. Not so much wrong notes and stuff, but less vibrato here. You're playing behind here. You're playing ahead here listen more with your section, those kind of things. Now, I love the score myself personally. And while I was waiting for this interview to begin, I was sort of singing Defying Gravity. But forgive me for saying this, but you're not bored with doing the same thing night after night after night. How do you refresh that interest? Well, Wicked is a massive show, which is crazy to think about. After all these years, there's still things to fix every. <laughs> night. Um, (laughs) You know, because there's so many different people. There's so many different principals that are coming in. There's different subs that are coming in. 
But you have your image. You know what you want. And that has a lot to do with it. Right. I know what I want. I know what I need to hear. I know what the director wants. I know what the choreographer wants. I know what Steven Schwartz wants. It's all those different things. And so a lot of it is, you know, last night I had to deal with some sound issues. So I deal with the sound board operator and head of sound. I had to deal with one of my actors was not feeling well. So we wanted to talk about how we're going to handle some parts of the song. I mean, last night was the 21st anniversary of Wicked. So that's always a fun performance to conduct. It's just absolutely fascinating. Yeah, it's just wild 21 years later and it's the biggest hit on Broadway, you know. But there are days where it's like, okay, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And then there's days where it's like more things to work on and maintain. But then there's wonderful days that are just like, we're just doing Wicked on Broadway and it's great. Have you had a show where you just went, wow, everything was absolutely perfect tonight? Well, I'm a perfectionist, which my husband proceeded to tell me, which was news to me about two years ago. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But yes, at the the root of it, yes, there has been shows. All right. We don't want to hurt any feelings. It's okay. (laughs) Yes. Yes. There are many days where I'm like, that was a great show. Wonderful. And you mentioned earlier that you've been very lucky in your career. I guess you never actually had to wait tables or be a barista. I am very fortunate, and I know how grateful and lucky I am. When I was going in and out of Chicago or, you know, and still, like, we'll get to, I have a production company on top of running Wicked every night. I would always, when work was slower or when I was in and out of Chicago, I was always a vocal coach. So when I needed extra money, I would coach singers and I still coach singers. And so that's where I was able to make a side hustle. But yeah, I'm very, very fortunate. No waiting tables. I would be fired the second I walked into a restaurant. (laughs) I would absolutely be fired. During COVID, when theaters went dark, I understand you did have to take a job teaching high school. And you had some funny stories from that period. Why don't you share some of those with us? Wow, you did your research. Oh, yes. That was a real time. It was middle school, sixth and seventh and eighth grade. I took it because, well, we just moved to Connecticut 12 days before the world shut down, which was a blessing, but absolutely terrifying to have this mortgage and my New York mortgage without my job. And it's not like I could coach people in person. You know, no one was seeing anyone. And it was right before the internet blew up where like everyone started teaching and I ended up teaching all around the world online. But yeah, the superintendent in Westport would called me and we're like, Hey, this is a long shot, but would you want to teach middle school, sixth, seven and eighth grade choir? And I was like, yeah. And they were <laughs> like, really? And I was like, can I do whatever I want? Like, I don't have to like follow anyone else's curriculum. They're like, yep, you can do whatever you want. And so I was like, let me give you four weeks. I'll do it for four weeks and then we'll reassess where I'm at. I mean, everyone was hanging on for dear life. So not to make light of that. No, it was a tough time. It was a tough time. They needed a lot of teachers. And so I came in the first day and everyone's in masks. I had 300 students, 150 in person and 150 online. And any teachers out there listening, God bless you, because I did not even understand how to work that program online of, I said, listen, we're all wearing masks. I know you don't want to sing. This is a weird time. So we'll sing a little bit. But I think I want to teach you all about all different styles of music and have a lot of my famous friends zoom in from the Disney Channel and Broadway and singers. And so that's what we did. We learned about Patti LaBelle. We learned about rappers. We learned about Leonard Bernstein. We learned about the London Symphony. We learned about the New York Phil. We learned about Tina Turner. What an education for these kids. What an education. It was amazing. And My teacher friends always laugh at me because, of course, like emotional Dan would then like have like real conversations with these kids. And I'd be like, how is everyone doing today? And I was like, no, really, how is everyone doing today? And there are days where some of these kids were so awesome and they were like, how are you doing, Dan? And I was like, I'm not doing great. And we would have like real conversations. I was like, 
I went home and cried today. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> well, it was real. COVID. It was. It was. It, it was again a difficult time for so many yeah. people. But these kids, do they know who Leonard Bernstein was? They do now. I mean, one student was like, you know, she was a little interesting, and she was like, I don't understand. It's just this old guy like waving his arms. Like, how does he make a living? And I was like, actually, that man is richer than all your parents. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But it was an awesome way to then teach these kids that there's a profession that you can do in life. You can have a profession in life where you wake up and you're like, oh, my God, I love what I do. And you make a great living. And that was awesome to talk about with those kids. That's wonderful. But I would bet you you wouldn't do it again. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I did last five weeks. And then I said politely, I'm good. God bless. And then I spent the next like 14 months teaching online and that really saved me. You may know that they're coming out with a a movie version of Wicked this year. In fact, it's going to be two parts. Has there been any working together on that or no? Oh, yeah. I saw it two nights ago. We went to the private movie screening down the city. And about a year and a half ago, I started doing the pre-records with Stephen Schwartz, where we did a couple new songs in the recording studio. and. Originally, they asked me who I would pick just to make the rehearsal tracks, and I hired six people from Wicked that I love. And so we did a lot of that. And then I continue on with the project. Stephen Aremus ended up doing the rest of the work, obviously, in London, but it's fabulous. It is enormous. You said there are new songs in it? In the second part, there's a couple new songs. First part is Act One and there's nothing new song-wise. There's a, all different new arrangements, and it's just incredible. So it's very exciting. It's very exciting. Now let's talk for a second about your entrepreneurial endeavors. My goodness, you are really busy. Thank you for taking this time. The International Music Theater Academy and Hit It Productions, why don't we talk about them for just a moment? And then, of course, your event company that brings Broadway into your home or business. But The Music Theater Academy, is that something you do online? We've done online and we've done in person. It was something we started with two of my colleagues during COVID. We ended up doing these week-long intensives with 16 different major players on Broadway at schools across the world. We would do week-long intensives. We did one in Switzerland. We did one in Mexico City. We did one in France all different places. And it would consist of anyone from Kara Lindsay to Robin DeJesus to Joan Later, all different people in the industry. And then just this past year, a couple schools have come to New York and it will be full week, 10 to six intensives that we will do. It's usually about 60 students. They take a lot of planning, so they don't happen often, but they have happened. They're wonderful. Is it primarily vocal coaching? It is everything. I mean, we have classes in vocal coaching, song interpretation. I bring in the dance captain of Hamilton, Wicked, and Juliet, and they teach the choreography from the show. I bring in composers, directors, Joan Later, Matt Farnsworth, like two of the biggest vocal gurus in the industry, casting directors, producers. It's crazy. It is crazy. And you still are doing Wicked every night, which is adds to the amazement. So and then how do you bring Broadway into people's homes or businesses? I mean, you've gone to Lake Canandaigua. You've gone a distance from Broadway. Yes. So this is I'm very, very passionate about this company. Again, this is a thing I started in COVID. How it came about was we were all out of work. And I was like, let me see if there's a market here. And I ended up bringing like three of my Broadway friends, done multiple Broadway shows, and we did a concert for someone in their backyard. And they were like, this is amazing. I was like, yeah, I know. (laughs) I think I've said wow too much in this podcast, but this is a wow. (laughs) Yeah. And so it was just like at a time where no one could go, obviously, to Broadway or see theater or music, we were doing these private concerts in people's backyards. And The Bedford Playhouse in New York ended up having, I'm on my fifth year now this coming summer. We do a Broadway series and I bring up all my different friends and we do concerts in the park there. But then this past two years, it's really morphed 
into where we'll do private concerts, public concerts, events. We just did something for Prudential for a corporate event. They had a Glinda and we did some stuff there. And then a lot of these places, these country clubs, these private dinner parties, all this different stuff where I have a database of like 25 different Broadway stars and I work with the client, whether they want certain people, certain styles of Broadway. And yeah, and it's really, really rewarding. And we've done about 25 concerts this year. Are they usually kind of montages, like a little bit from Cabaret, maybe a little bit from Chorus Line or? All different things. I, I had a client a couple of weeks ago. It was like, I just want to hear Andrew Lloyd Webber and Stephen Schwartz. And then I had a client the other day was like, my demographic is a little older. So I want to hear more like the golden age of Broadway, everything from Oklahoma up until Phantom of the Opera. Then I had another client that was like, I want to hear Hamilton, Wicked and Oklahoma. So it really runs the gamut and really anyone can pick and choose what they would want for their event. I also had someone also for their cocktail party for a wedding and they wanted these nine love songs of duets. And then I had another person was like, we love Frozen. Can you bring John Riddle from Frozen and do four or five songs there? I'm not going to say wow again. I'm going to say very interesting. (laughs) You know, on your, uh, I think it's your Instagram account. I'm not sure, but there's a quote from Alice Walker. And it's, look closely at the present you are constructing. It should look like the future you are dreaming. Alice Walker, of course, from The Color Purple. Let's go into that quote just briefly because it's a wonderful way to end this podcast. I mean, look at the present you are constructing. It should look like the future you are dreaming. How does that play into what you do and what you think performers everywhere should do? I luckily have always been a firm believer and have seen it come to fruition about I've always been a big dreamer, but about really, really honing my energy into what I want from my life and really, truly seeing it and believing it into fruition. And there are moments that I have in my life where I was like, I literally have dreamed of this moment. And it's kind of like, there's no words to that sometimes. But I think as I also am at a point in my career where I've been on Broadway for 17 years, which has been amazing diving into this new adventure with my company, with Hidden Productions and doing these concerts and bringing this kind of extremely high level of talent to people. It's extremely rewarding. And it's very important to me to work with people that I enjoy being with. And so I'm able to hire friends and colleagues of mine to make music and to make money and to bring joy and music into people's lives. That's wonderful. Lastly, What's next for Dan Michike? What's next? Well, the most important thing in my life right now and will always be is my son. We just had a baby four months ago. And so that is the best. What is really next? I mean, it's going deeper into what I've been doing this last year with juggling Wicked, with my production company, with my vocal coaching, and just really going deeper into all three of those worlds. And just putting it out there, if anyone you know works for Radio City, my big dream is to become the music director of Radio City, the Christmas show. So anyone out there? <laughs> <laughs> Dan, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for being on Harmony Talk. And we wish you the best of luck with Radio City Music Hall and Wicked or whatever. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. This podcast has been brought to you by AM Sky, or a third generation family insurance business started in 1920. I'm your host, Lisa Shampo. Talk to you next time. 